All right, well, let's get started. So it's my great pleasure today um, to welcome you all to this um, bi-weekly VEMO seminar. Um, today's speaker is Mariana Safranova, who's a professor of physics at the University of Delaware. Our, she has a really broad range of research interests. And so um, I'm really excited to hear about the work today, which is on um, quantum sensors in space, but other topics of her research include quantum technologies to search for physics beyond the standard model, of elementary particles and fields, developing quantum atomic and nuclear clocks and their applications, ultra cold atoms and quantum information, studying fundamental symmetries, dark matter searches, quantum many body theory, and developing high precision um, atomic codes, including a data portal, which I think she's going to tell us about a little bit more today. Um, Mariana is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a past chair of DAMOP. Um, so many of you will know her. And um, we'll join me in looking forward to her talk. So um, Mariana, please go ahead. Um, and just actually, let me say one more thing, <laughs> but don't go ahead. If you wanna um, ask questions um, of the audience, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar or um, the chat function. I don't know what it's called in YouTube. Um, and we will collect the questions from both places and um, uh, maybe pause a couple of times during the talk to, to answer some questions. So hopefully we can have some interaction even across the distance here. So with that, I will <laughs> hand it over and um, we'll listen to your talk now. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and introduction. So a uh, hundred years ago, we thought we knew everything about the universe. We had, uh, you know, new technologies and, uh, um, you know, mechanics, electromagnetism, thermodynamics. And uh, it seems to be there were just, you know, a few small problems like, you know, spectra of atoms, for example, were not explained or a few other things. And uh, as we know now, of course, that at that time, a uh, hundred years ago, out of all the standard model, exactly one particle was discovered in electron. And now it's been a hundred years and we're kind of back to the same where we were, only on a higher level. We again think we kind of know everything about the universe. We have our standard model of elementary particles and we have found all of those particles. Of course, we know there are major problems with our standard model. Just as a hundred years ago, there were some things which were not explained. And just as now, we have a kind of a big problem that if the standard model were true, our universe would not exist. Just because if you look around you, you really don't see much antimatter. Well, it would be kind of a problem if it were here. So somehow when our universe was uh, uh, happened to be existing, out of a billion antimatter particles, there was a billion and one matter particles. So when they all annihilated, there was something left and that's something that's our galaxy and us. So it's a really important problem. And we really don't know how that happens. And uh, nothing in the standard model actually shows the capability of it to produce such a disbalance of matter and antimatter. We have checked, there are no antimatter galaxy, galaxies hiding out there. That would have been a beautiful astrophysical signature. You can't miss it. And of course, there is this big elephant in the room, or you know, more than one. We don't know what universe is made of. We do know that our standard model only composes about 4.5% of our universe. In fact, if you look at all those beautiful stars, it's only 0.5% of the universe, matter, energy composition. So, what other things do we assume? So when we compare experiments, when we compare experiments in different parts of the world, what do we assume should hold for our scientific method to work? Well, I mean, the Lorentz invariance. We assume Lorentz invariance. We assume if you rotate your experiment or if you boost it with a uh, uh, certain speed, that the, in principle, nothing should change. The laws of physics would be the same. Your experiment would be the same. We assume position of variance as Earth and your experiment moves around the sun. You assume that does not matter that experiment in June and July, barring some environmental problems, should be the same. You assume the equivalence principle. And then, of course, we assume that fundamental constants, yes, all those, you open your textbook and you see your list of fundamental constants, that these are actually constant, meaning they don't change in time or space. And then, of course, we assume our standard model. And it really makes a difference because when you compare experiments, you assume we know particle and forces which contribute. And at this point, we know that's not true because we already know that standard model is incomplete. 
And then we know that fundamental constants, well, they, they don't know, but we're pretty sure they're probably not constant. In fact, in very large number of uh, beyond the standard model of physics, they are not constant. Lorentz invariance would be violated in quantum gravity model. And uh, um, a lot of dark matter, all of our ultralight dark matter we know and love, would actually violate the rest of, the rest of this. So it's interesting to see now was a, if any of that is actually true, and to see how we can actually look for the violations of those fundamental principles of modern physics with atomic physics. And of course, now we all know we can do it because atoms now which are cold, trapped, and precisely controlled. And the more time goes, as we all know, the more precisely we can control them, and we are sure this will continue for many decades to come. Therefore, there is exceptional improvement in precision of those quantum sensors, and uh, that enables completely new physics uh, uh, searches and tests of fundamental physics postulate. And of course, the quantum sensor is a very, very broad field, and uh, so I will talk about only atomic quantum sensors. And of course, a lot of people ask, what is a quantum sensor? So uh, Dmitry Bootker, who is actually, I think, is present here and can uh, account for that as well. And I decided that at some point, uh, um, being an editor for this focal issue in quantum science and technology, I highly recommend if you're interested in the topic, look at this focus issue. There are more than 20 papers. And they're not just research papers. They're essentially a future proposals and new experiments for the next decade in this topic. So we decided to take a broad view that any technology or device that is naturally described by quantum mechanics is considered quantum. Then a quantum sensor is a device measurement sensing capabilities of which I enable by our ability to manipulate and read out this quantum state. And it's important, we decided that manipulate and read out is important. So by this definition, atomic clock is a quantum sensor, but the spectrometer is not. Which kind of, you know, seems okay. So uh, if, a few years ago, uh, we kind of noticed that there is a more and more experiments for this uh, search for broadly new physics, including dark matter, with atoms and molecules. And uh, you know, our, we decided to put together a team and just review the field. And honestly, even we have not expected just how large the field is. So the this field starts with you know kind of the oldest subject, the precision test of QED, which is by the way now extraordinary flourishing field because now we can measure things much better. Then atomic parity violation, then uh, T violation, CPT violation, when C is a charge, P is parity and C time. Uh, Lorentz symmetry test, as I've uh, shown the question, there is a question whether Lorentz symmetry actually holds. And then of course, searches for light dark matter, variation of fundamental constants, and actually even not so light dark matter. Searches for exotic forces, general relativity, tests of gravity, searches for violation of quantum statistics. It's really a vibrant new field. So at that point, we had about 1,100 references. The past 100 references were added just between submission and referee reports. And that was pretty much just new references we showed up. And I think it's, it's even grown uh, since that time. So today, I will only speak about dark matter searches with atomic and nuclear clocks. And then I'll a bit talk about our completely different field of research, our atomic portal. So why search for dark matter? Well, because it's there. There is fantastic amount of evidence from all different kinds of astrophysical observations that we really missing most of the matter in the universe. And most of you probably heard about those rotation curves. So uh, the velocities of stars and galaxies don't seem to you know, recede as they're supposed to. They seem to stay about flat which means there is a lot of matter somewhere else there. But then of course there is gravitation lensing, which is much, much harder to explain than anything else. But really the decisive um, evidence for dark matter, it's even not gravitational lensing. It's the fact that galaxies exist. And, and why is that the proof that there is dark matter or at least the very strong evidence there should be dark matter? It's because cosmic microwave background essentially it prints a picture, it's a beautiful experiment, it's a picture of a universe as it was when finally the hydrogen became neutral. So finally the protons and the electrons could form neutron hydrogen and that means the photons were free 
to roam in the universe. And those are photons we're still seeing now. So this is an imprint of the universe at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. It's a rift shift of 1100. And that shows this is over density, it's essentially this product clumps of the uh, your matter were only about 10 to the minus four. And if you think about how that should propagate in time, how it would just turn on the evolution of the universe and let the time run, turn on the gravity. And then you find that those over densities could only propagate to become denser and denser and denser clumps at some point linearly with the redshift as long as it's small. Well, multiply those two numbers. There shouldn't be any galaxies by now if that's all there is. So remember, the dark matter can clump before CMB, but the normal matter cannot because it's charged before the CMB. So in this case, all the simulations show if you start with the CMB and then let the matter evolve, that only having the dark matter explains the large scale structures. So those are yellow spots are galaxies and galactic clusters. So this web, which we see here perfectly essentially agrees between the simulations and between the reality with honestly with dark matter only. When you get to the point of galaxies, individual galaxies, yes, then normal matter actually becomes uh, important here. What is our dark matter? Could it just be something in a standard model? Well, clearly not photon because it's light. Uh, this couple to plasma, so definitely not dark. These decay too quickly. And that means explaining dark matter must have been produced at the early universe and it's still here. So it must be either extremely long-lived or stable. And then neutrinos are uh, technically they are they are dark, but they're too hot. So all the simulation shows dark matter cannot be neutrinos because they really are still relativistic at same day. So that's just some portion of our dark matter, but that's not enough. So I'll read is a simplest idea for dark matter right now that no known particle can be called dark matter. So we need to search for new particle. And look, it's kind of hard to believe that it's a single particle. Yes, the dark matter could be 100% new particle and this is it. But you know, universe is probably much more interesting than this. Of course, we have our standard model. We also have plenty of particles there. We're not sure like why we have them in the first place. Like, why do we need a tally? I, um, uh, for example, and why is just not enough to have an electron? Why do we have a muon and we have tau and then neutrinos? So most likely, of course, the be quite likely the dark matter can be quite a, just a whole dark standard model out there. I will stop here and ask if there are questions. I'll encourage people to put them in the Q&A. There's a couple um that have come up um one question is suppose that dark matter doesn't just interact with luminous matter other than through gravity or, um, are we done are there things that we can st still learn about the dark sector or is this unlikely okay okay so uh that's a good question so the answer is yes it is possible that it's not talking to us except gravity and but there, there's a consequence if it only interacts through gravity it has to be produced through gravity because dark matter had to be produced somehow through some physical process. Now, uh, it is not impossible to produce dark matter via gravity, but it's pretty complicated. So it's, it's possible, but uh, so people can make up models, but generally the most assumption that it's been produced through some kind of process which doesn't track through standard model. So if it was produced through a process which involves standard model particles, then we should be able to detect it via you know, the same type of interaction. So, and actually, even the worst case scenario, that it really just gravity, we can still actually do a lot of astrophysical observations. In fact, it's astrophysical observation which actually limits uh, the lowest mass of dark matter, because at that point, essentially, your model of the universe starts becoming fuzzy. So if you ever heard this fuzzy dark matter term, that's why. It really starts to affect the simulation, because, well, when you dark matter, wavelengths there becomes the size of the galaxy that will affect the galactic structures. So at that point, dark matter will stop binding galaxies. So um, as I said, we hope that it interacts with the standard model. It's, uh, you know, very, very hard to come up with, you know, ways. I mean, there is, of course, a zillas which are produced by gravity only. 
Uh, but on the other hand, there is another part here. There is a lot of other problems which have nothing to do with dark matter, which involve having extra particles. So even without the dark matter, we probably have a lot of particles out there. Okay. It's conceivable that none of it is related to each other, but there's yeah. still a lot of stuff to search for. Okay. You know, because all of those, the string theories is automatically, essentially, is, as soon as you start compactifying them, you end up with extra ultralight particles. They may not be dark matter, but they still could be there. So I think there's a very good reason to look for them anyway. Okay. There's another question from earlier. Um, how can we tell that some galaxies out there aren't made of antimatter? Is it just because of um, we don't see the matter-antimatter annihilation, or is there some other way to tell? Okay, this is way outside my field, but I presume that you know there'd be a lot of you know uh, extra light in the sky if this galaxy you know collides with a normal one. So yeah, okay. um, I'm sure I can look up how it exactly is done, <laughs> but people have looked for it. Sure. Just... Oh, um, there's another new question here. To what extent is quantum sensor and quantum sensing a hype, which may not be with us five years from now? Well, atomic clocks have been here for thirty years. So let's say quantum sensors are just very useful thing because remember the word sensor. I mean, none of those were built to detect dark matter. We just found, suddenly we found there's a lot of these new detectors out there which we could use for dark matter because the clocks are needed for metrology, they're going to be used for metrology. For example, when you want to send missions you know, to the um, different planets in our system and you actually want to make sure those things actually land where they're supposed to, it would be nice to have a clock on board. Uh, and the same goes with interferometers and magnetometers and all the other devices. There is extraordinary good reasons to actually build them. More than that, we can build them better and better. When they asked, when I'm asked about perspective for the next 20 years, I said, our field didn't exist 20 years ago. So, um, and also we could actually detect, we have ideas how to detect dark matter more and more with quantum sensors. And also there is enormous amount of particle theory work who just suddenly found there are a lot of other detectors out there which are already built. So I think pretty much uh, that uh, that is actually a very valid area of research and it's both practical and uh, applied. And also LIGA is a quantum sensor and it does detect gravitational waves. It's a very large quantum sensor, but it actually measures beyond the standard quantum limit. Sure. And gravitational wave detection is certainly going to stay with us for a long time. Fair enough, I like the optimism. Maybe we can move on with the rest of the, or the next part of the talk, okay. thanks. So, and now, uh, as I said, we do not know what the mass is. So why people look for WIMPs? Because, well, there was a very good reason to look for those weakly interactive massive particles. If you plug an interaction um, you know, of the typical particle of that mass through the weak interaction, you get just about the right density. Also, they could solve hierarchy problem. So there was a good reason to look for them. We just haven't found any. So now there is a good reason to look for everything else as well, in addition to WIMPs, especially axions. But I will not talk about axions today. I will talk about scalar and dark matter particles. As I mentioned, on this side, they're limited by astrophysical observation. On the side of a very large particles, they're really limited by Planck's mass. If the particle is of Planck's mass, then it's a black hole. So, and black holes have been looked for as well. Uh, then, of course, it could be a composite thing, but we, let's talk about particles only for now. And uh, as you see now, this is a, a GLS transient clock. And yes, if it does look like a more quantum computer, it's because it's a very similar type of technology. It especially looks like a, you know, the AMO lab. And, and now it is a dark matter detector. And the uh, important part, these are tabletop devices. OK, there are few tabletops, maybe. But they could be put uh, and have been put now in a truck. Uh, quite a few already constructed. They're based on different atoms. Usually, they're on the metrology institutes. So, or the several clocks usually in one place. And there are, of course, few uh, not, uh, not beautiful examples when they're outside Meteorology Institute. They will be made portable. Prototypes exist. And there is a lot of effort to make those portable. And uh, also, what's called the push the button clock. Right now, atomic clock, it's not something you can just push the button and it works. With a BC, you can now push the button and it works. Uh, but, but not yet with atomic clock. But it will be. So, and the projects already exist, they're already being constructed. They will continue to rapidly improve, or eventually will be able to operate them autonomously, which means they will be sent to space. And I'll talk a little bit about space. And the big problem for the WIMP detectors, they have to be underground. 
And when you have to put your detector two miles underground, and that kind of places a bit of a you know damper on actually making experiments quick and uh, you know making lots of those experiments. So uh, cosmic rays have absolutely nothing to do with detection of dark matter flux could, or actually any of the type of atomic quantum sensors could. So uh, they do not have to be underground from standpoint view of particle physics. So now, uh, if you have ever used a GPS, you've used atomic clock. And the clocks on the GPS are not even on that plot. They're really very, very, very old technology. They are accurate about, you know, um, uh, better than another second. So uh, the microwave clocks as such, which is on GPS, have continued to improve. And, but at this point, they kind of reached 10 to the minus uh, 16. And that's really the technological limit here. So the modern clock are now based on uh, uh, the new clock on optical transitions. And what it gives you, it gives you five orders of magnitude and frequency extra. So essentially you can, uh, you have very, very narrow lines there as well. And uh, uh, there is, we don't right now know the technical limits, how much you can improve them. So they are far from technical limit right now, but just put the perspective here, uh, the most precise atomic clock and quite a few of them, will not lose one second in 30 billion years. That's what 10 to the minus 18 means. That's more than the lifetime of the universe. So what is a clock? Uh, you need a system with a periodic behavior. So it cycles at some consistent frequency and it could be a pendulum and it could be a, a quartz clock. And of course, atoms make beautiful clocks. The reason why the atoms make beautiful clocks, they are perfect oscillators. The frequency of atomic oscillations in the same environment is always the same, which can be said, for example, quartz. So take a sample of atom or just one. For ions now, they work on one clock and then uh, one atom. And then you build a laser in resonance with this atomic frequency. So essentially, the clock works as a tuning instrument. So here are your atoms. That's your standard of frequency as the, the atoms always uh, then oscillate with a given frequency. And then you tune your laser, tune your laser until you get to the right frequency of atoms. And then you fix uh, that frequency and you keep measuring. And then of course you keep measuring because laser will go off frequency and off phase, but atoms do stay the same. So you keep measuring to then uh, maintain the right frequency. So here is our interrogation scheme. What's actually being measured is a population of atoms. So it's a very light, kind of a bit of a quantum computer. So you have the zero and one, and you make a sort of position of zero and ones, and then you make a rotate it on a, uh, on a block sphere, and then you make a measurement. And then you see then whether you need to adjust up or down. Well, usually you make a lot of measurements. And then eventually you uh, measure this frequency, which is what's called the frequency comp, but that's a different laser. The important part here is that you don't need to measure the absolute standard because cesium is absolute standard, is the only absolute standard of their secondary standards. And this is not precise as those clocks. So you can just compare two clocks with a frequency comp without ever comparing to cesium. So you can measure the frequency ratio of those two clocks with the precision of your clock. And that's a, a typical uh, clock interrogation scheme. And that's important for the purposes of our dark matter detection. So you do pi over two pulse, you wait until those atoms superposition evolves, you rotate uh, around the block sphere, I mean, you have another pi over two pulse, and then you make a measurement. So when we start detecting dark matter, it's important whether you will or will not get several dark matter oscillations during the wait time. Because if you do, you start losing the sensitivity. That's what eventually defines what frequency of dark matter you can detect as clocks. Of course, uh, people have invented many other things, including dynamic decoupling, uh, which allows you to actually pick up uh, signals which oscillate faster than your wait time. So then you just apply pi pulses over and over, and that actually allows you to even extract maybe signal. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. So this is our atomic oscillator, and this is how the clocks work. And therefore, uh, because the clocks can detect new physics effects just because we understand the standard model signal so well. So I'm frequently asked like, how do you know that some sort of electric field or magnetic field or temperature doesn't affect your clock instead of it being dark matter? Well, because you have actually looked into all those effects. That's what metrology does. 
it actually studies all possible systematic effects before it say my clock is accurate at times of minus 18. And even then it compares with other clocks to verify that those things are actually correct. So, and that's the point that we understand the standard model signal in clocks very well, because that's what is required to do by metrology. So now if we have some new physics, which affects the clock frequencies, it will shift the absolute frequencies and we can detect it. But then you can ask, well, but how would you know that it shifted it? Because in different clocks, the effect would be different. A lot of those variation of fundamental constants, especially a variation of alpha, they are proportional to essential, well, they depend on how relativistic is your electron. So just pick a light clock and pick a heavy clock, and you already have a differential of how the dark matter will affect your clocks. And then you can pick a different clock, the highly charged iron clock, a nuclear clock, and you have a big, even bigger differential in there. So it's a measuring a ratio of two clocks, what they're doing here, two clock frequencies. So how is a clock frequency depends on fundamental constant? Any optical frequency will depend on Wittberg constant. So this is automatically alpha square. If we're comparing optical clocks, we don't care about the alpha square part. We only care about some additional dependence. If we compare optical clocks to microwave uh, or to the cavity, then this two becomes to matter. And for a long, long time, since you know the very beginning of the clock development, people have just looked at the drifts of the fundamental constants. They would have just assumed that, well, if you just wait long enough, you measure every couple of months or so, that eventually you look where the alpha changes. And in, in part, that was a very highly motivated by some astrophysical signals, which indicated that alpha was different in the past at the time. But then very recently, that entire effort was sort of revitalized because it was realized that ultralight dark matter itself can cause changes in alpha. So if the dark matter, it's a scalar field, then it's actually possible it affects clocks directly. So how does it work? So first, where is dark matter? It's here. So for example, in this cup, if uh, dark matter is a wimp, there will be like a couple of them in there. If it's ultralight, there's really too many of them to come. But the important part is our galaxy, according to our dark matter model, is surrounded by dark matter. In fact, that's why we never notice dark matter in the solar system because the density, it's about like one hydrogen atom per few cubic centimeters here. So in the solar system, as of now, our limits on dark matter are actually very poor from just, you know, even motion of the moon or other planetary bodies. However, the total dark matter, if you count for all of those one extra hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter, and then extend that this is a, just a huge sphere of it, which extends far outside the galaxy, then the total dark matter completely sort of outsource the normal matter in this case. So our sun goes around the galactic center and our uh, planet goes along with it. So for all purposes, we can think about that just there is a dark matter wind and it blows in our way and we, that's the dark matter we're detecting here. And then uh, which dark matter? If our dark matter is light, less than 10 electron volt, it has to be bosonic. You just can't put that many fermions together. So the Fermi velocity would be larger than the escape velocity uh, as soon as you reach about 10 electron volts. So this dark matter will never actually be able to clump in our galaxy. So it has to be bosonic. And if it's a bosonic that you quite immediately realize that if you start getting to lighter and lighter um, frequencies, lighter, lighter masses and higher frequencies, then you end up with dark matter, which is no longer really, a, I mean, it is a particle, but we don't longer care for detection purposes. This dark matter acts as a coherent entity. So it's essentially just a classical field because you have very large occupational number within the debris volume, you actually have a very large number of dark matter particles. So therefore, for all purposes, it's just the cosine wave. And now, how do we think it interacts with this uh, standard model? Yes, we don't know what dark matter is, but as long as we are not violating the spin statistics, it has a spin, zero, one, and well, pretty much it, because, well, there's enough already dark matter candidates without a tender dark matter, um, so no one is that bold. 
And if it's spin one, it could be either scalar or pseudo scalar. Okay, there are, there are also particles which can couple either way. If you have CP violation, you can both actually have scalar and pseudo scalar couplings. But essentially, as soon as you're saying that this dark matter has spin zero and it's a scalar, we know how it can couple with a standard model because it's just particle physics. Then. So now we have uh, your, our dark matter can either just be directly linearly coupling to the standard model Lagrangian, just take your cosine wave multiply by the standard model Lagrangian, or you can just have powers of this. It could be phi squared, phi cube, but if linear coupling exists, it's dominant. So if it's suppressed, then we look for the quadratic coupling. So what consequences would such dark matter have on clocks? So here's our logic. Dark matter coupled to electromagnetic interaction and to normal matter. What does it do? It will make fundamental constants oscillate and all the mass ratios oscillate. Just because you just multiplied your F mini F mini term by the oscillating term. So alpha is in front of us, alpha is defined by it. So now alpha oscillates. Then if alpha oscillates, then atomic energy level oscillate because they depend on alpha. And then clock frequencies oscillate, but different clock oscillate differently now. So this can, okay, I'm sorry, is the different clocks uh, affected differently by it. So you can be detecting dark matter by just monitoring ratios of two clocks over time. Well, depending on how much time you have, some of the older experiments go back 15 years. And you know the beautiful thing, that just metro, what metrology does. It compares clocks. Now for dark matter, you can tweak uh, those protocols to actually you know, be specific to a certain masses of dark matter, but it's a very broadband detection. It could be limited from uh, above and from below, but it is broadband. So the first thing people did, uh, we analyzed all limits. So this is a beautiful dysprosium experiment. And this is rubidium cesium. Uh, they had about 15 years of microwave clock data. And now here is this uh, red, are uh, the new data from uh, Jilla group. And this is actually a clock cavity comparison because when you have a cavity, and this is just part of your clock laser, that cavity technically, if you vary fundamental constant, it will vary in length with the Bohr radii. So now that variation proportion to alpha, clock to alpha squared. So you have an additional assumption sensitivity factor of one. So you can compare it to cavities. And the green is a projection. Uh, for the future experiments. And there is also this uh, aluminum plus mercury plus have been actually redefined. And there is a new aluminum plus or terbium and terbium strontium comparisons which is just below this line as well. So the main question is, how do we improve further? In fact, you know, it's a great thing if you're building a new detector, how we can do many, many orders of magnitude better. And of course the obvious result first, well, we can just improve clocks. And honestly, we don't know how far the rabbit hole goes here, but it definitely goes orders of magnitude here. So uh, that's of course, you know, the one way, so naturally this limits will get better just because clocks get better. But then the next question, can we build different clocks? Like for example, can we build clocks based on nuclei rather than atoms? And in this case, I build my clocks based on nuclear transitions. Well, that seems like a great idea. The only problem is remember clock needs a laser. Anyway, even I am not optimistic to say that we're going to have mega electro volt lasers in the next 10 years. So it's really as a problem as the nuclear transitions are way outside of what's available, you know, uh, in controlled ultra stable lasers. And that's going to be a long time before if, if, if it's possible to catch up with this. So uh, if you can do lasers, then the, can we do a specific nuclei? And the answer is here is yes, there's one, just one nuclei, uh, thorium to 29, which has an isomer, meaning excited state, which is within laser accessible region. There is a uranium, but this is like the 89 EV, so that's a bit too far as well. So in thorium, you have, of course, your excited nuclear states, but then you have this ground state splitting and this is actually about 550, uh, I think the, the combined uh, volt average is 457 at this point, uh, 147 at this point. And the lifetime is estimated about a few thousand seconds. So it's a very narrow transition. And this is a chain one uh, nuclear transition. And uh, there is an effort 
by many collaborations in the world to actually try to build such a clock and to actually detect the photons or laser excite such transition, which have not yet been done. So the reason why nuclear clock, what is the difference here? So the difference is that the sensitivity to the variation of alpha predicted to be much, much higher. And here is, there is just a simple hand waving logic. Where does sensitivity to alpha come from in the nuclei? Well, you have your Coulomb energy and you have a strong interaction energy. And that comprises your total nuclear binding energy. So just because somehow you end up with uh, this accidental cancellation doesn't mean that those energies are small, means that they just cancel one. So we expect that the Coulomb energy between those two isomers would still you know, be the MOV scale. I mean, as a physicist, it's hard to believe an accidental cancellation of you know, 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 9. So, uh, and if this is an MEV scale, and there've been some experiments to see actually if one can measure the differences in radii in the quadrupole moment of those two states, then essentially you're dividing about 10 AV by MEV, so you get 10 to the four, 10 to the five uh, sensitivity factors. And I think the current sort of fixed value is about 10 to the four. But there is a large uncertainty there. But at any rate, we don't really care what the number actually is. It doesn't go into our detection. It's just the larger is the number, the larger is the chance of actually detecting the dark matter here. So we expect in five years, uh, then to be prototype nuclear clocks based on both solid state and trapped ions. And this is, by the way, the expectation from my experimental collaborators. I am a theorist. So in hopefully in 10 years, we'll have a high precision clock. And then all those limits you've seen, you can just drop them essentially by six orders of magnitude. Uh, I will not show really our, any of our detailed atomic calculations, but I'll show you the portal. But I just show one of our new capabilities to compute atomic properties. Uh, there have been a very nice proposal to actually laser excise this transition in uh, thorium, in the ion of thorium, the thorium 35 plus. And the reason why such a sort of an exotic system, because there is, there is what's called expected an electronic bridge. So if you accidentally can make it so that this laser photon is almost exactly the right energy as a nuclear state, then you can actually laser excite this as a meric state much, much easier. So essentially what, what electronic bridge is, it creates incredible enhancement in the probability of oxidation. So it's just much easier to excite. And uh, uh, people were curious whether those predictions were correct. So we carried out uh, very, very, very large scale computations. And the predictions there was um, that the energy is about 840 EV, but and actually the energy from this to this state. So essentially what you do, you excite here, and when this day excites, it automatically essentially excites the nuclear, just because those energies match nearly exactly. And uh, we found that uh, our projected energy is actually very close to the nuclear clock. So, and again, it's in fact, the uncertainty here is smaller than an uncertainty excitation for the nuclei. And this is one of the largest scale calculations which ever did. It's a 1500 uh, CPU computation with, if you know about CI codes, it's a, more than a hundred million determinants. So we actually kind of, our next idea is to start selecting configurations with neural networks. So we actually have this, now we can calculate this very complicated systems and that creates opportunity for us uh, to participate in many other interesting projects, which we couldn't do before. So I'm going to stop here because in the next, I will talk about our, uh, about, about some of our efforts in space, about the uh, space clocks. So questions. Yes, we do. Uh, there's one from Bill Phillips, um, which says, is a change in alpha apparent or real? That is, does the dark matter act like a fifth uh, force that mimics electromagnetism or is it really, does it really change electromagnetism? Okay, the electromagnetism acquires extra term. So no, it's not, in this case, it, it's, it's not interpreted as extra force. I mean, you could do uh, EP experiments which could measure the same effects. So you can actually pick up this variation of alpha and EP experiments. But what essentially happened that, no, the F menu term itself does not change. So electromagnetism, it's electromagnetism you know and love. It just in front of it, now instead of, you know, alpha, there is alpha plus varying alpha. So it literally changes fundamental constants. So electromagnetism itself doesn't change, but its effect does. It's probably as best I can explain. But you could actually look through the same effects by fifth forces. Yes, 
uh, in fact, torsion balances could be, uh, could be, will be affected by it. And torsion balances uh, experiments have been sort of recast as a light dark matter searches. So it's, yes, it will, the, the same dark matter will source the uh, extra forces on in violation of EP tests, yes. There's another question about the spin. So why do we expect cold dark matter to be a spin zero boson and not a spin one boson? We do not. It can be both. And we are looking for both. Okay. We are looking for all of them. So we are looking so the, for the spin one. If you ever heard the term dark photon or hidden photon, that's the one spin one boson is. And numerous experiments are searching for it. In fact, if you're interested, we actually now finish a community white paper for snow mass, which is called uh, ultralight uh, new horizon scalar and vector ultralight dark matter. So send me an email, I'll send you the link. Sounds good. Um, with nuclear clocks versus atomic clocks, are there any expectations that baryons and leptons might interact with dark matter differently, or is the only thing that matters the dependence of the energy splitting on alpha? Yes, they all could interact differently, and it actually de uh, depends on the dark matter type. So, and that's what actually great about the nuclear clock, because it will be sensitive to interactions with the nuclei. For example, the relaxion models, and relaxion is a particle which helps you solve this hierarchy problems that WIMPs can solve, but it's ultralight. It actually, uh, it's limit through the nuclear clock are much better than through gluons coupling, actually, through than through the electron couplings, or I mean, through the electromagnetic couplings. So yes, they all could interact differently. It's a different terms of the Lagrangian. All right, and I'll ask one more question. It's a bit experimental, but how good does an optical comb need to be? I, how narrow do the teeth need to be in order to measure this 10 to the minus 18 accuracy with, for optical yeah. clocks? So I'm a theorist, so I can tell you that my experimental colleagues understand how to do it at 10 to the minus 20, as I understand. But if you have someone in the audience who can jump, feel free to jump in. So, uh, so frequency comps are as good as we need them for a while. And I'm sure and they're getting better. And they're also getting to be working at, uh, at VUV and uh, to the much higher frequencies. All right, well, maybe it's a good time to um, proceed and we can have, have some extra time for questions at the end if okay. there's any more uh, related to So um, a year ago, I was completely, didn't know anything about sending anything to space, but it turns out to be that there actually are uh, very interesting things happening. So there is ongoing NASA, a NASA decadal survey about biological and physical sciences in space. This is by the way different from astronomy and astrophysics in space survey. And uh, this is now ongoing and uh, of course, you know, many interesting questions arise as, you know, people think about what uh, priorities um, and what interesting things NASA can do for the next 10 years. And then Europe actually uh, had this process uh, a little bit earlier. So they have been a question to the cold atom community as to how does one actually get from that clock, which I showed in the lab on a few tabletops to space. So the question is whether those technologies are very fragile or not. And also, why do we want to send those things to space? So there is a document online in the archive, uh, which is essentially a very large and very extensive document developing a community roadmaps with milestones to demonstrate the readiness and reason for those technologies to be in space. And many interesting things uh, can be done only in space with quantum technologies. And uh, as of now, there have been very few demonstrations, of course, uh, of quantum in space, but they, of course, um, there is a cold atom lab on the ISS and now uh, atom interferometer. So the first steps have been done. And the next question is what's the next step? So uh, the question then, why do we want to have clocks in space? So of course there are many practical reasons to have clocks in space. For example, if you want to link optical earthbound clocks on the different continents, you want to have a clock in space because there is really no particularly practical way of doing it otherwise. Uh, and then, of course, there's a good practical reason that you can do a specific geodesy. You can actually look at the Earth's uh, gravitational potential if you have clock in space. Uh, but then, of course, there is a very good new fundamental physics studies which you can do. For example, dark matter or especially dark energy effects could be just screened on Earth. It's Camille, it hides. And actually, the same thing can happen for dark matter. If it has quadratic coupling, it could be screened, meaning you're just not going to see it on Earth but you could see it in space. And then um, space enable tests in the varying gravitational potential because it allows clocks to really test gravity. And I'll show you a proposal from the focus team. 
And then, of course, in uh, on space, you're limited by the seismic noise when you detect gravitational wave frequency. And uh, in space, there is no seismic noise. And actually, on the moon, you have very little seismic noise, but that's a different question. And then uh, if you test Lorentz violation, then you're actually not limited by how Earth rotates or how you can rotate your apparatus. This clock's actually it's Earth which rotates, you, you know, touch rotation of, uh, you do not rotate your clock. But in space, you can actually pretty much design different booths, different orbit, different, uh, uh, and the, you can limit different combinations of those Lorentz violating coefficients. And then of course, space presents many opportunities to test for gravity. Also, if dark matter has non-standard distribution, because you could have halos around Earth, around Sun, you should be detecting it actually from outer space. And of course, microgravity along baselines, there are many other reasons which are not quite, you know, that applicable to clocks. So there are many interesting reasons why do you want quantum sensors in space? Well, besides quantum internet. And this is proposal by the FOCUS team, which I was uh, invited to collaborate with. And the idea is to have a high precision lattice optical clock in space. So this is a single clock experiment. So you have one clock on board, but this clock actually have an optical link. Such links have not been demonstrated, but that uh, there is tremendous work in this direction of how to actually compare um, <clears throat> optical clocks in space, because you can no longer actually use microwave um, connections you can use right now for the GPS satellites. So this is also interesting technical challenge. And this clock will then rotate uh, on elliptical orbits, orbit around Earth. And the reason why the orbit is elliptical is because we would like to actually test gravity. We would like to look for what's called, oops, sorry, anomalous gravitational redshift. So here, uh, the clock tick rate depends on the gravity. So here, if there is no anomalous gravitation redshift, it's just going to be the difference in potential or C squared. But here and now we actually look as gravitational potential changes as going around the orbit. Uh, one can improve the test of alpha by more than four orders of magnitude. So this is a uh, blue, it's the best previous experiment. That's the projection for European clock and this proposes in this work. So the science objectives there would be other tests of relativity, enhanced searches for dark matter and drifts and fundamental constant, establishing a high accuracy international geodesic references, then linking the other clocks in orbit, but mainly improving the GR test by 30,000 times beyond the current limits. And the other recent work has been inspired by the Parker solar probe. And it's a fantastic experiment. If you haven't uh, looked at that, it's essentially a probe which touched the sun. And it's really fantastic technological achievement. So, uh, and uh, our interest in there, what, what happens actually if you could send clocks in there? So our proposal is to actually send uh, a clock comparison satellite mission with two clocks on board. And you don't really have to go as far as a Parker Solar Probe was. And they actually had contact as a Parker Solar Probe people to ensure that, okay, clocks will not necessarily die if you do that on board. So it looks like some uh, reasonable, environment can be maintained with sufficient shielding, which was on a Parker Solar Probe. And the interesting point that if dark matter is ultralight, then it's possible that it can actually cluster around the sun. It can create, sun, it create a bound state around the sun, meaning that you'll have much, much larger densities of dark matter near the sun, which such probe can detect. And it's also, it then will be limited by very specific masses because it's defined by very specific rules if you start producing such a halo. You can also probe what call this relaxion dark matter particles. And also you can actually look just a variation of spatial fundamental constants, just because you go from the uh, Earth's potential gravitational planet to space to near the sun, you actually can improve the present test by many, many orders of magnitude. And here is a projection limit. And this work was um, inspired by uh, 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 Yudai Tsai and uh, uh, Josh Ebo is, um, uh, a particle physicist who uh, proposes and uh, the idea is that you can actually improve the limits by many, many orders of magnitude just because you have so much more dark matter to detect. So if such halo exists that you can actually detect it uh, with uh, those clocks on about uh, such orbit. So you don't really have to even go as a, as a Parker solar probe. Okay, so now the year is 2022. And think about it. 
when we solved the physics problems of 1922, when we understood atomic spectrum, when we understood all the other phenomena which turned out to be quantum, we got quantum mechanics. And let's face it, I'm using that screen. The, all of our technology is now produced essentially by quantum mechanics. So, so many of our technologies just really came from solving those strange problems, the atomic spectrum. So, undoubtedly, we fantastic unified dark matter. But when we solve those problems, we can also think what new wonders those discoveries of new physics, what technologies also will, will it bring. So, now I'm going to finish with dark matter. And how much time do I have? It's about nine minutes till we should close the session, but. Okay, so minutes. I'm just going to essentially take a one minute and show our completely different effort. So a lot of uh, different fields require atomic data. And we decided that we are just going to separate all possible atomic computations to things which we can calculate routinely, things which we can calculate and uh, can share with everyone else and things which we have to work on how to calculate. And we decided for the first two groups, we would like to essentially develop atomic software to say computer calculate, because usually atomic code don't really work as a software. There are all those complicated inputs you need to know about configurations and shells and everything. If you essentially wanted to be at the level that we essentially just tells computer which levels we need and which properties to compute. And we have developed atomic portal with collaboration of um, University of Delaware computer in the electrical um, uh, engineering departments, and this is available online. Uh, many of you have seen it. We are now close to releasing version two. Version three will have uh, all those alkaline earths and other interesting ions. Version four will have codes, and uh, we would like to really hear your input, and I'm just going to show you in just a moment how the new version works. It's an improved design, and um, so this is not yet publicly available. The first 12 elements are publicly available. So now if you click on an element, so now you can actually easily choose which states we want, transition rates, and uh, for example, see all the data. If there's experiment, you can click, uh, then you can download this Excel. You can have the lifetimes. It plots polarizability graphs for you. You can even combine polarizability graphs. So it's a new resource. A new version have uh, all the clock data for so these are all highly charged ions which have been proposed to clock. And you can click and uh, see everything which was published uh, about those highly charged ions. Okay, so uh, at this point, I would like to then thank you and uh, thank all of our collaborators and group of seniors to Delaware. Thank you so much. Thank you for a really exciting talk. Um, there's. There are indeed a few questions um, at the end here. Um, one is sort of a big picture question that I will put out there and there's maybe a few follow-ups related to this. So are there modifications to gravity or relativity that could explain the astrophysical evidence for dark, dark matter without new particles? Um, and if so, are there ways that the clocks could actually help detect those okay. differences? So as, okay, so the one thing is, what does it mean explain? So what we want, is another theory which from first principles, so you write your effective theory, for example, from first principles, you can actually derive, yes, that's how universe should look like. The such theory as of now, alternative to the, to, alternative to the dark matter does not exist. So people have tried. So one other thing you can do phenomenology, you can just say, let's say acceleration changes and let's see it depends, acceleration would depend on, uh, uh, on for example, distances or gradation on something. So let's say you sometimes will get Newtonian gravity, sometimes you'll have deviations from it. So this is really not a theory. This is pretty much a postulate. And unfortunately, with all those theories, you can explain the rotational curve. You cannot explain the CMB. So there is no alternative explanation which explains all of the effects of dark matter. And I think people should look for it. I absolutely think that people should look for alternative explanation. Just no one has come up with it, which explains all the things dark matter explains. So related to that, I mean, uh, Bill Phillips says, how crazy is it to imagine that dark matter follows different rules? Maybe there are boltzons or they don't respect angular momentum rules or whatever. Is there? Um... Let's say that, you know, if you're kind of, you know, standing here looking under the lamplight and you know, looking for dark matter, which is kind of more seem to be straightforward to find. 
When you say, I don't think it matters because let's say it could violate statistics, but it still could, could if you're looking for all possible interactions. So if it interacts somehow, we should still be able to see it. So, uh, but there is no evidence that it should actually, but yes, uh, for example, relaxing could have both scalar and pseudo-scalar coupling because it couples as Higgs. So, I mean, dark matter could be very weird things. So essentially, I was only talking about the most straightforward models, but there is enormous amount of very interesting other models in there, but I don't think it affects the detection strategies here. Okay. Um, sort of a question specifically about the, the space, um, clocks in space. If the Earth uh, screens dark matter effects, how far away do you need to go to escape that screening? Mm -hmm. So first, let me make sure this is not standard dark matter. So generally, I mean, the linear, the dark matter with linear coupling for the scalars cannot be screened. So only the dark matter is quadratic coupling. Essentially, you either want very, very precise clocks on Earth. So I think at 10 to the minus 18, you are almost outside the screening range because you just, you, so it's not itself the screening, it's how also precise you can, uh, so how small interaction can you detect? So screening means interaction just harder to detect. So the more precise clock you have, the easier to detect interaction. But if you want to be out of it, uh, I think about radio first. A few thousand uh, kilometers should be completely outside. Okay. Um, a little bit outside of the realm of dark matter, could you comment on the complementarity of equivalence pr principle experiments and direct searches for fundamental constant variations? Yes, uh, and here there's actually a difference. So the difference between uh, EP searches, equivalence principle searches is that you do not assume it's dark matter. So you don't actually care what density of those things are. So you never actually put dark matter density in EP constraints. But for the uh, clock constraints, yes, you actually have to say this is 100% dark matter to get current limits. If it's not 100%, the limits will be below. So there is a fundamental difference here. Okay, and the other one, the last question I have here is um, a practical one about the database. Is the terbium in the database right now? Unfortunately, no, uh, not of the alkaline earth yet. And the terbium is, as you know, it's very, very tricky to compute. So uh, eventually we would have everything. If you send us your compilation of all terbium data, we'll just post it online. So, so we, can, we can accept Excel table. If you just send us, like for example, we have data on dysprosium. Because you do, because you know people have been working on this project for a long time, but it's not none of it is a NIST database. Send it to us; we'll put it on the portal. It, that's what we did for highly charged ions. We decided to just provide as much data published, which are published as possible. So we could do this. So for others, we actually do the full recomputation of everything and put the new data for the portal. But we could put just a compilation of somebody's uh, um, full experiments there as well. All right. Um, I think there's one more question that just came in here. Um, can the oscillation in the clock frequency so um, do can that distinguish dark matter particles from standard model model particles, or could there be other explanations? Right. So that's yes, there are other explanations to laser noise <laughs> because that's on top of your laser. That's a, <laughs> so what you do, you essentially have a series of time measurements, and so what do you do? You convert the series of time measurements you do for your transform, you transfer to frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, you should see a peak of dark matter at constant count of frequency. And it's slightly asymmetric just because there is dispersion. And of course, there is all the other peaks in frequency which has nothing to do with dark matter whatsoever. But generally you can sort them out. So the great thing about dark matter that if you really, really think that's dark matter, if you really have ruled out everything else, because generally you can model your laser ones then if you look at a different clock pair, you can actually use dynamic decoupling to do narrow band search, because then you apply extra pulses just exactly at the right spaces and you can accumulate the signal. So, and then you know the ratios of the amplitude of the signal because it goes as a ratio of sensitivity of the clock, which you do know. So this is a verifiable signal. Okay. Well, it's a good place to end. It's um, right on the hour in whatever time zone you're in, I think. Um, and yes, uh, so just one announcement before we end. The next uh, Vemos talk will be in two weeks on Friday, March 18th. Uh, the speaker is Shelby Kimmel of Middlebury College. And he, uh, they're all talking about uh, speed ups for quantum algorithms with easier inputs. Um, the last point here is that Shimon has just added a link in the chat for everyone. Uh, there will be a post-seminar discussion and it'll be in a separate Zoom room, so you'll have to